Chapter 13 Quo Vadis Prison and War There was interesting development in the court premises. Before walking into the courtroom, I had gone to the men's restroom and found a couple of men busy cleaning the place with water pipes and some even scrubbing the floor. Surprised at the flurry of activities in otherwise neglected part, I asked them what had happened. One of them turned towards me and said, You don't know? Khaled Azia is coming to court. I couldn't quite relate the appearance of Khaled Azia with the cleaning of men's restroom. But then, there were more surprises. Walking into the courtroom, I found the dock decked with a red carpet, the chairs lined with red velvet and cushions. Khaled Azia coming to court, but I am sure not this one. But there were more to it than met the eye. Khalida Zia and her party had grown under army protection and patronage and these were but the signatures of a relationship still in place. That partly explained why Khalida Zia was taken into custody months after Sheikh Hasina was arrested. I welcomed Sheikh Hasina to the new regal honor in custody. A comical display of respect to Khalida Zia showered even beyond her courtroom by those who meant it but couldn't find a better way to do it. Sheikh Hasina also commented that the deflected honor reaching her living quarters in form of better furnishings. The court, having framed the charges, went into fast-forward mode with hearing held every day. Sometimes, in two sessions, I gave up on this ersatz trial and took to reading and talking to Sheikh Hasina, who too felt the same way. There were rumors that the trial was to be completed within the stipulated 90 days and convictions given. Sheikh Hasina was unruffled. Her nerves were steady in the face of mechanician. At the same time, there were feelers sent to strike a compromise. Under such stress, she talked about an incident that I guess was in her mind as a guide. In 1968, the Pakistani regime filed the Agartala conspiracy case, charging her father, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, with sedation, the trial taking place in the cantonment a mile away from where we sat. When Sheikh Mujib was reaching the pinnacle of his political career and the dream of Bangladesh was taking its final shape. This led, unfortunately, for the regime, a mass movement for the release of Sheikh Mujib. There were quarters struggling that Mujib go for a compromise. Sensing these people might influence the leader, Begum Mujib, rushed young Hasina off to her father with an important message to stay firm with his head high and not to take any decision without consulting her. But the courier had to reach the cantonment before anybody else did. Sheikh Hasina did not fail her mother. The government was forced to withdraw the case and a grand reception was arranged for Sheikh Mujib at the race course Moidan, where he was anointed as Bangobundhu, friend of Bengal. It all ran in the family. Sheikh Hasina's old Fupi, some 80 plus years old, waited outside her jail compound for hours in scorching sun, insisting that the guards let her in. Finally, they gave in. Sheikh Hasina went rushing to her and offered her cold water, massaged her feet, scolding Fupi for the hardship she went through to meet her. Smilingly, she replied that she had gone through all the troubles only to warn her not to give in to any intimidation and to hold her head high. While Sheikh Hasina stuck to her ground, she was pained by the schemings of her old political colleagues, lamenting that they never came to see her once, although she thought of them as part of the big family. 
Sheikh Hasina too was determined to go out only with honor. A small man as I am, I suggested that she should put her health first in considering any option. She handed me a copy of the criminal procedure code for me to take a look at the provisions of law, but I couldn't quite offer any suggestion. In the meantime, news reached us about the grassroots convention in Dhaka, where the workers rallied to voice their unqualified support for Sheikh Hasina and determination to thwart any conspiracy to undermine her leadership. In the dock, Sheikh Hasina had a souvenir in her hand, published on that occasion. While a few of the old guards had flipped over, she showed me the many articles and poems written to boost her morale and as tributes. Eyes glistening, she showed me a poem written by an old friend she had not met for years since her days in college. I had one modest comment to add. It was adversity that always tested friends and loyalty and she had won the day. I was pressed by my cellmates and later the politicians of both parties to impress upon Sheikh Hasina on launching a joint movement. Since I wasn't a politician, I refused to be any kind of courier and take advantage of my access to Sheikh Hasina during the long hours of waiting in the dock, while court proceedings continued. Only once, pressed by Ubaidul Kader of Aumi League, I mentioned the strategy as a suggestion from Kader while distancing myself from any political discourse which, which has not been my cup of tea and on the sidelines of my inquisitiveness. Sheikh Hasina made a tentative nod of approval and suggested that the students could try form a common platform. Days later, I saw a dream in my early morning nap supposedly an auspicious time. Sheikh Hasina and Khaled Azia were walking hand in hand along a corridor resembling the many labyrinth in inner pathway that are so special of our Shangshud Bhavan. While I was following them a few steps behind. Then Khaled Azia headed for a room on the side while Sheikh Hasina carried on and I stood guard, hugging the wall with a hood nearly covering my face and possibly a spear in my hand, like a Praetorian officer. When I told my cellmates of the dream, in one loud voice they insisted that I should relate this sought-after precinct review of alliance to Sheikh Hasina. In the dock, hesitantly, I told Sheikh Hasina of this political dream. She gave me a smile, one of those political aces, which was up to the onlookers to decipher. Court appearances continued. Every now and then, our conversation moved to family recalls and updates. Sheikh Hasina fondly recalled her stay in Triste, Italy, where her husband, Dr. Wajid, had moved to work at the nuclear laboratory and her hand at cooking meals occasional burns as reminder of her new responsibility, a common experience of all newly married brides in this part of the world. In prison now, she warmed her food in the microwave oven, a much easier task. She was concerned when her daughter Putul and her family were moving to Canada from the US. Putul's husband, Mitu, at the steering of the U-Haul for the long journey. I was having a glimpse of the frugal, down-to-earth life of the most celebrated family in the country and a prime minister as a mother and a grandma. I had my own good news to share. Duli was expecting her first child, our first grandchild. Sheikh Hasina was very happy and congratulated me in advance. I was looking forward to the arrival of the first grandchild with a joy I had never felt before.
The political scene was getting murky. The law enforcing agencies were on a spree of mass arrests, particularly targeting the young and those who lived in the shanty towns and the bastis, for they were the potential troublemakers if some movement was launched against the regime. Jomuna was coming apart at the seams with the arrival of streams of youngsters from all over. One convict with despair writ large on his face told me that his only son, who had been looking after the mother since he had been in the prison for the last 10 long years, was arrested by the police and his whereabouts were not known. Another was the story of a young man, newly wed, being taken amidst the wail of his wife, a tokai, hardly in his teens, was put behind police van when he was collecting precious little scraps from the garbages early in the morning, and the story continued. From my own experience, I knew that they were entering a black hole to be lost and consumed. I was reminded of Rohinstone Mysteries, One Fine Balance, the novel written against the backdrop of emergency in India in the 1970s, was the most scathing indicament of Indira Gandhi. It was the tale of small people on the margin of life. A band of beggars in the street of Bombay, the best among them, made their living by entertaining passerby with calisthenics of their mutilated torsos. Another group of ordinary folk eking out life as small-time tailors in a decrypt apartment illegally. And yet another upscale family from the hills of northern India, slipping down the social ladder in an inevitable twist of life. All brought together, bitten by the malicious fangs of emergency rule. It's torture, intimidation, and even denial of elementary recognition as human beings. The great leveler stripped them of all dignity, reduced them to an assemblage of outcasts, dismissed a social abbreviations and an embarrassment for the shiny metropolis, a new generation of beggars. This tragic, heart-wrenching story was about people who never mattered in politics, never featured more than a nuisance in urban life, or never were claimants to any of nature's bounties, yet streamrolled under the weight of arrogance of a demonic government that was eventually the nemesis of Indira. Deja vu. Over three decades later, in another part of Indian subcontinent, the same story was unfolding. I saw a wasteland with piles of smothered institutions and fleeting dreams. The blood would dry up quickly, but the wounds would remain fresh, gawning, bitter reminders of scores to be settled. I saw a wasteland with piles of smothered institutions and fleeting dreams. The blood would dry up quickly, but the wounds would remain fresh, gawning, bitter reminder of scores to be settled. Could a tormented, panic-stricken and beaten society gather its wits together to make a new beginning? Could the lost legacy be found and regained in the wasteland of despair? Could the final loss of innocence ever be retrieved? Would a wounded prophet, as in Paolo Coelho's Green Mountains, emerge to resurrect life on the ruins of the valleys and the mountains of the biblical settlement near Babylon, burnt and leveled by the murdering hordes of Assyrian army? Our war was entering a new phase. Strings of youth camps were being set up along the border as holding camps for thousands of young volunteers eager to join the liberation war. I accompanied Captain Hafiz on one of his tours to recruit men 
for his battalion. Once the mission was announced over the loudspeaker in the camp, young men came rushing to enlist, as if deliverance had arrived. Besides measuring height, weight, and chest, Hafiz had improvised his own set of tests. Aspirants were asked to run as fast as they could, climb up the tree, standing up, jumping off the branch, give push-ups, run again, climb up, a set of ropes, jump off again, till the recruits were gasping for breath. In the meantime, he had made his selections. Those who made it were ecstatic with joy, while those who didn't walked away crestfallen as if they had lost for good. This determined youth told me that victory would be our handmaiden. In line with strategy, to carry our fight forward, the front had been divided into sectors and three regular brigades were being raised. Young men from youth camps along the borders were being dispatched for training and returning to be inducted inside Bangladesh as guerrilla units, both to operate independently as well as establish network with the nearest cells. Major Osman's was appointed sector commander. Sector 8, his headquarters, moved to Kolyani, some 30 miles west of Petrapol, inside India. By then, the fighting men were being regrouped as part of Bangladesh Defense Forces, deployed in Sector 11, apart from independent brigades that were being raised. I was given the task of captain, writing orders, collecting supplies, and maintaining liaison with the Indian Army contact, Brigadier Salik and Brigade Major Roy Chaudhary. He later became the Chief of Staff of Indian Army, provided us with supplies of arms, ammunition, POL, and rations. But all that, the job of a glorified clerk. Hafiz, Mahbub, and I managed to get a furlough for a day to Calcutta, our first visit together. Carrying our arms in the back of the jeep, we entered a metropolis humming with the routine chores of life, unaware and untouched by the storm that has swept our lives. Another world. It was evening and we decided to dine at the Great Eastern Hotel. Leaving the jeep in the parking lot, we walked up to the hotel, oblivious of our shabby clothings and unshaven looks. The doorman, an enormously tall guy in Sherwani, wearing a turban on his head and a handlebar moustache, gave a surprised look and asked us what had brought us to the hotel. We want to have our dinner. Any problem? Hafiz had a curt reply. The doorman looked us over again and said, we have a dress code for the hotel. Can't allow without a tie and looked the other way to get rid of vagabonds hanging around. But we were not about to give up. I mentioned to Hafiz that I had few ties in the suitcase at the back of my jeep. My orderly Osman, while abandoning my residence in Meherpur, had quickly packed some of my belongings in a suitcase, little realizing the artifacts that I had collected were far more valuable than this used clothing. Then let's go and get dressed, Mahbub suggested. Standing behind this jeep, I took out a few wrinkle ties. Each of us put a knot around our neck. The soiled collars were an insult to the British legacy. Back again to the Great Eastern, as the bewildered doorman looked on, we walked in straight to the dining hall where the live music, a sonorous voice, singing one of Frank Sinatra's popular song. Strangers in the night, exchanging glances, wondering in the night, what were the chances we'd be sharing love? Before and dim chandeliers welcomed us in the world of the rich and the famous. The night over, we headed for our stations.
I was getting bored with the staff job and missing action on the front. Major Osman gave me some message to be personally delivered to Captain Huda, then a subsector commander of Sector 8 at Boira. I jumped at the offer and left for Boira. Captain Huda was busy with the missions in hand, reviewing maps, giving instruction when I popped up there. In his typical jovial mood, he said, The staff captain of the headquarters. Any fresh instruction, boss? What's the news on the front? According to the CITREP situation report, you are giving the Pakis a sound thrashing. I gave him a complimentary smile. Welcome to our world. Want to see some action? Are you staying long enough to join us? Captain Huda's offer was just one I was looking for. He continued, We are having an interesting visitor today, Senator Edward Kennedy. He want to see us, Mukti Bahani in the camp. Excited at the prospect, I pleaded, Can I join you? Oh, sure, was his reply. In an M38 captured jeep, Captain Huda at the steering while I sat on the back of the seat, the young U.S. senator keen to learn about us was taken around. We drove through furrowed fields, the jeep often threatening to skid. Still, we reached Captain Huda's camp. The men gave the senator a formal welcome. Ted Kennedy went around the camp, inquiring about our welfare, preparing for the fight against the Pak Army and recent missions. He was visibly impressed by our determination while noticing the uphill tasks we were up against. Well, all the best in your heroic struggle. I shall try to do my best to lobby for the international support, including that of the U.S. Senate. But you may be well aware of the stand of our government. Many of my colleagues have protested against it. We were encouraged by the words of the young Kennedy. Many of us had idolized his assassinated brother, President Kennedy. The senator had traveled a long way to see us and lend support to our war. We drove the senator back to the safety of India. Early next morning, Captain Huda had planned a raid on an enemy position with small group. I joined them. We walked along the village path through a route, although selected after reconnaissance, which was a routine drill before any mission. At one point, the path broke off and we were moving through open fields. Suddenly, a burst of gunfire welcomed us. We dashed to the ground and crawled for cover. We had come close to an enemy petrol. Our Turkmen position and a heavy exchange of fire ensued. I sent a few bursts of my AK-47 too. My first in the war. One of our men got excited and shouted, Son of a bitch, I'm going to take you down. He stood up and started firing single shots from his 303 rifle at a position he had identified. Before other could dissuade him from this suicidal move, a bullet hit him, luckily on his leg. He fell down and our men crawled to retrieve him. I left the camp of Captain Huda with a renewed faith in our ultimate victory. No one could even guess that Captain Huda had left his young wife and two children in Calcutta. The camp at Boira was his life and the war his lone mission. While still a staff captain at Kolyani, another opportunity came for me to visit the front. This time, Mahbub's camp at Bhumra, further south in Sector 8. Since I turned up without any notice, it was a big surprise for Mahbub. We hugged each other, exchanged news, and had lunch together. Mahbub was planning a raid on a nearby enemy position, and I immediately volunteered to join. It's a hit-and-run raid. Textbook case. We have identified a weak spot in their defense and the plan is to inflict casualties by surprise attack and extricate ourselves quickly. 
Mahbub was giving me some idea of the operation. Sounds exciting, I remarked. Looking forward to the task as a subsector commander, hoping to be one someday. Around 10 p.m., Mahbub gave the final instruction to a platoon of men at detention, who would be the part of the main body and who else would take position to cover the rest. Having done that, he called out, Is it loud and clear? Any question? The two parties will separate at RV, rendezvous, and regroup there before we head back to the camp. Anyone found in duty will be severely dealt with. His men nodded in agreement. We walked some distance from the camp and entering Bangladesh, took a circuitous route on the enemy position to raid from behind. The two groups parted at RV, as decided earlier, and the main raiding party, Mahbub leading stealthily walking in a single file along the aisle, which is the mark that separates the land ownership in Bangladesh. I was somewhere in the middle and hadn't taken a good look at the map to know our whereabouts. It was stupid of me to walk on blindly, depending on others. The party stopped and started taking position, the enemy defenses visible in silhouettes. I guess this was agreed earlier, but before the order was given to fire, one of the men opened up, exposing our presence and position to the enemy and gave time to reorient their defenses. Surprise was lost and a messy fight ensued. The first burst might have inflicted a few casualties, but each time flares went up from the enemy camp lighting the sky to identify us. We had to take cover and stay motionless to avoid detection. This limited our opportunities to fire back at the enemy. With our one platoon plus strength, Mahbub didn't think it's worthwhile to continue and ordered his men to withdraw. The covering fire came in to help keep the enemy pinned down while we moved back to the RV. It was planned to return via a different route, shorter but across a marshy swamp. While crossing the knee-deep water, I had a strange feeling of being beaten in my leg. But there was no time to check and we stopped only after joining up and covering party at RV. I found leeches sticking to both my legs and blood oozing out. The leeches were no surprise to the reconnaissance party who had carried a bottle of kerosene as an antidote. The men washed my leg with kerosene which helped to have the leeches get unstuck. But their marks, like those of eczema, were souvenirs that I carried back to Kollani. Major Zia, another sector commander, showed up at Kullani. This was the first time I was meeting him. Short in stature and well-built, he always wore sunglasses. Beside exchanging news of the front, he broached the subject of any possible reproachment with the park authority. According to him, he was on a mission to assess our stance on the war. It was intriguing to find a sector commander traveling a long distance from his place of duty during the war on a mission which should have been that of a political leader. I was shocked and a chill ran over my spine. What are you saying, sir? We have nothing to negotiate with an enemy who has killed innocent civilians in the tens of thousands, raped our women, burned our villages with flamethrowers. Major Zia interjected. Just an option. I'm not suggesting that we accept. There could be no such option. If our politicians do so, we will be a bunch of fugitives with no country to belong to. I added with dismay. The story of Mama 
facing a similar situation in 1946 in the wake of Bombay mutiny crossed my mind. The discussion did not go any further, but it left a lingering doubt in my mind as I drove Major Zia to Calcutta. Eventually, giving in to my tenacity, I was made subsector commander of Sector 8 and given charge of F Company at Petrapur. I was excited to be finally heading for the front in charge of a subsector. All the way, I was talking to myself as to how I would deal with my newfound responsibility. I was frail even by Bangladeshi standards. How would I inspire my men where strength was the winner? Would they take me seriously? Although I was known to be a maverick, I hadn't yet proven myself on the ground. Would I survive to see victory? It was getting dark and pouring when I reached Petropol. Captain Halim, a regular officer from the army, was being replaced by a man who learned from the street. But Halim was gracious. While getting the briefing from Captain Halim, I learned that he had captured half a dozen Rajakars, collaborators with Pakistan Army, who had been sent to the border to be disposed of. I had by then taken charge. I asked the Havildar Major to get in touch and bring the Rajakars back to the camp for questioning, although I had other ideas in mind. Captain Halim, in the meantime, left for headquarters. The Rajakars were brought in, blindfolded, ten of them. The guys were trembling in fear of execution. I asked them, Why did you bear arms against us, sided with an enemy who is killing our countrymen? In chorus they replied, We are ashamed. Give us a kick on our ass, beating as you want, torture us for our misdeeds, but don't kill us. We want to be with you and fight alongside. Joy Bangla The silence of the night was broken by their shrill cry. From the look of them I knew these were poor villagers who had been tempted for a small sum to bear arms and guard places like bridges and roads. It was beneath my dignity to square up with them when we were preparing to fight against a professional army. I decided to take the risk. You are free. Go wherever you want, but just don't come in our way in the future. The Rajakars were confounded and in disbelief moments ago, they were saying their last prayers and here they were hearing that they had been set free. I asked the Havildar Major to feed them, give them 10 rupee each and set them free. The Rajakars shouted, Joy Bangla! Joy Bangla! And a few of them fainted. They pleaded to be taken in and be allowed to fight alongside. I would be happy if you help us with information about the enemy. In chorus, they again replied that they wouldn't let us down. As it happened later, they didn't. My first test came the next morning. The company would go for exercise, starting with jogging, and I was to lead them. I wouldn't meet any physical requirement of an officer. Weighing less than 100 pounds for lack of nourishment, nevertheless, I led the group. Along the Grand Truck Road, where Colonel Meg Singh was our first cheerleader, we started to jog. I knew that there was a fatigue point that would come early and have to overcome to stay on my feet. I was determined but wasn't sure that I could make it. But the old Havildar Major was more far-sighted than I had thought. He sensed the captain might fail the first test and shouted, Halt! I realized that I was in good company. The camp was on a raised field by the side of the Grand Truck Road, living quarters, armory, kitchen, etc. were in army tents. I had a cot and a table inside. The camp was guarded 24 hours, 7 days a week, 
with passwords, which changed every day for entrance at night. We were in peri-urban settlement, strings of houses around the camp, and a cluster of shanty shops some distance away. Having learned to take our presence for granted, although we did take away the privacy they were used to, the neighbors looked at us from afar with curiosity. Mine, as well as the subsectors, were under a sector. In our case, Sector 8. We were to take independent missions in line with the strategy set by the sector commander, who was formulated by the BDF force with headquarters in Calcutta. The company's strengths were around 100 plus, mainly comprising of EPR men, JCO, NCOs, Ansars, Mujahids, with a few from Army and Air Force. Those who had been on leave in Bangladesh from their unit in Pakistan and switched sides to join us. We were supported by Indian Battalion at 9 Division, stationed next to our camp commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Sidhu, a typical Sikh with beard and turban. Arms, ammunition, POL and other supplies were provided by the Indian unit. Meg Singh was gone since border security had taken over by the Indian Army. Petrapol was not the same nor would ever be without Meg Singh. Subsector commanders' responsibilities were manifold. They were the forward positions of BDF stationed along the borders, maintaining contact with the enemy outposts closely. Raid such positions and at times go inside behind the enemy lines with missions. The Mukti Bahini guerrillas were returning after training from Indian camps to be inducted inside, preferably to their own countryside, with arms, ammunition, possible targets and advice about general mission tactics. The subsectors were their base. The gorilla cells were to connect with one another and coordinate their missions. They are to come back to the base, report their mission achievements, get new supplies and instructions, if there were any. Those gorillas who came from nearby localities of the base were retained. My contacts with my family members were at best tenuous. I was informed that my mother with my two brothers was hiding at the residence of relative at Dhaka, frequently moving from one house to another, scared of retribution from the Pak army, had they found them. My elder sister Fatima in the US was able to find the address of our headquarters and send mails to me, which used to arrive with some delay. She became the link with my family members living in Dhaka, West Pakistan, and the U.S. Although I had moments of concern and a longing to see them, I kept them away in my conversation, putting on a brave face, knowing each of us had his share of misfortunes. Small intelligent staff of my company were to collect information about the enemy location and suggest possible missions. We were told about the Park Army badly mauled at one of the border outposts, would abandon the field if we could keep up the pressure on them. This was my first mission. In the meantime, I was asked from the headquarters to take a BBC team to one of the captured positions. I took the risk of taking them to this outpost hoping to dislodge the enemy with an early drawn attack. A platoon strength, we were dropped off past midnight at a point on the Indian side, about a mile from our target. We waded through a small canal, waist deep, holding our arms and ammunition up above the water. The enemy position away from the base was vulnerable. Our boys have been harassing them frequently, inflicting casualty every now and then. With the approaching dawn, our platoon got closer to the outpost and stopped about 150 yards away, hiding behind the bushes. I could see with the binoculars the dim light of the camp, shadows walking around. The intelligence report was correct, as the monsoon cloud cleared and the crimson pall 
of the morning lighted the surroundings, we saw them packing up. Since they were about to move, they had rolled back the defenses with apparently none manning the bunkers. We all opened fire in one go. The surprise attack took them off guard. There was chaos in the enemy camp as we pushed further, taking cover and moving forward. The Pakis literally took off running from the post with firing back at us aimlessly. Once the fire stopped from the enemy position, we wanted to assess their whereabouts. Retreating troops often laid ambushes for advancing opponents and booby-trapped their abundant positions. Cautiously, we moved forward leaving a small group to give us covering fire where we to face unforeseen challenges. The villagers came out to confirm that Park Army had left and none were in hiding. Our platoons raised the slogan of Joy Bangla as we entered the outpost which one bore the mark of wounded soldiers, blood still fresh on the floor. We were ready to receive our guests. The BBC TV team was brought to the captured BOP. We, ho we told them how the enemy chickened out and abandoned their post. In the face of our attacks, the cameraman took videos of the camp while our boys showed them around. I was interviewed. Who are you all? Mukti Bahini was my quick reply and I added, we are a miniature Bangladesh, farmers, students, men from EPR, Ansar, Mujahid, police, army, air force have joined hands to liberate our country. May I know your background? He asked. Without batting an eyelid, I put a fake identity, fearing retribution for my family. I have been a school teacher, abandoned my job, joined them. By the way, the school is closed since the families left for India in mass exodus. The atrocities were far too inhuman. Where do you grow from here once you have captured BOP? Asked the journalist. I had the answers ready. As you can see, we are tightening the news around the enemy by making it costly for them to man remote outposts. Once they start retreating, it eventually have domino effects on their morale and the robustness of the defense. The interviewer interrupted. You think you can continue the fight and win on your own? Let me ask you a question instead. While the Pak army, worse than the Mongol hordes, continue on their mission, the world around should watch this callous indifference? Where is the conscience of the world? Today, if they were not on the run, the Pakis would have burned the village, killed a score and then take young women along. A nation of 70 million, determined to liberate their land, cannot but succeed against an army with no scruples, no hold barred. I stopped. When do you think you can liberate your country? I had only history to guide hope as beacon and replied, come and join us in the New Year party at Dhaka. See you then. I had surprised visitors at our camp. The statistician come singer Benu, who had short fling with guns at Bengal regiment camp at Petrapol, came over with a team to sing and cheer us up. Shahin, Tarek and Naila among them. In the dim light of the camp, we sat on plastic mats while they rendered patriotic songs, one after another, accompanied by a harmonium and a pair of tabla. We felt nostalgic, carried back in the Halicon days, when seasons came with messages of romance, when the world was a place surrounded with endearment and affection, when life was sweet even with unrequited love, when the future held promises unfulfilled, a lingering melancholia for the vanished El Dorado, violated and torched by the murdering Huns, land that came to life in the verdant color, bathed in monsoon showers 
an embroidered quilt. Its meandering rivers and the unending fields in the eternal embrace, music and dance celebrating their union, a happy abode under the sun. our tears, eyes glistening, a magic wand had brought back our lost world to us. Evenings were our time to get connected to the world. BBC News from our small transistor brought faraway land and news of the world to our remote camp, our ears raised like an antenna at any mention of our war. So was Shadhin Bangla Betar a radio station of our government that gave detailed account of each day's news at the fronts. We took pride every time our subsector was referred to and the camp would burst into cheers. Particularly entertaining was the satirical program by the Mr. Akhtar Mukul. The ultimatum, Chorom Potro, he compiled operations of Mukti Bahini each day and depicted the miserable plight of the Pakis, badly mauled and running for life in the dialect of the denizen of Old Dhaka. It was tough to translate the humor in English, at least I couldn't. But listening to each episode, the camp used to burst into frenzy of laughter, riding us some of the stresses of uncertain future. We had informed that Park Army using a herring bond road was carrying supplies. It was planned to mine the road and if, if possible blow up the enemy vehicle. With three Mukti Bahini gorillas from the locality and a Havildar to lead, a small group was detailed for the mission. After a couple of days, the gorillas returned without the Havildar, reporting that the mission had been accomplished and a jeep had been blown off. I was concerned about the Havildar, finding the boys reticent and seemingly hiding something. About to lose my temper, I asked, Aren't you ashamed that you returned without your commander? No reply. This infuriated me and I warned them of the severe consequences of concealing facts. Meekly, one of them spoke. The Havildar got into some family problem. But he was not from the area he went to cover. Did he leave and go home? Another, another of them got courage and replied, No, sir. While planning the operation, he fell in love with a girl from the village, a distant relative of mine, and married her. He didn't have the face to return. I held my composure, cut short the conversation and said, That explains. You can go now. I had mixed feeling about the incident and didn't know how to react. This was an act of indiscipline and called for tough punishment. But mine was a hybrid company, a voluntary assemblage of desperate fighters, not fully mirroring the armed forces. I called the Havildar Major to my tent for consultation. Three facts were before us. The absconding Havildar was a courageous guy he had performed his mission but married without permission while on duty. The Havildar Major suggested that we could get the guy back, put him through some disciplinary procedures and let him off leniently. I nodded in agreement, not having a better solution. After all, this was an irregular war and his rules needed to be bent when romance came along. He returned and Havildar Major worked out a solution and I intentionally overlooked. But whenever he appeared before me, I knew for sure he was ashamed of his impulsive action. 
I could see in him a desire to make up for it and he did much too dearly. Leading a group in an ambush, he was giving covering fire, while another team was assigned to cut off the enemy convoy for the main ambush party to take on. He felt guilty for not having been with the leading the team. The convoy was stalled and was sprayed with bullets, but the enemy regrouped to fight back and our ambush party was having difficulty to extricate. The Havildar adopted a resolute stance in the face of heavy fire on his position and kept giving covering fire till his men could extricate themselves from the situation they were in. But he couldn't and died holding the gun. In the usual process of analyzing intelligence information, we honed at the outpost of the enemy at Potuakali manned by elements of 22 Frontier Force, west of our location. This was isolated, although with strong defenses. The monsoon offered access to the rear of the post by boat. While the enemy treated the vast expanse of shallow water as a natural defense. After a briefing on the planned raid, two platoons marched along the border for two hours through early hours of night till the selected entry point was reached. We boarded a number of open boats with an unusual guide, an infamous dacoit, fugitive from law, who knew the area like the back of his palm through the many of the robberies he had committed in the villages. He had volunteered to lead us to the enemy position. The monsoon floods had turned the village paths into a winding canals in places with strong currents. The night was pitched dark. Each boat with a primitive device, toy sold in village fairs, that made tic-tac sounds. Used improvised morse code to keep in touch with the other boats. It took longer than planned and the platoons reached the appointed position when it was almost morning. Well past dawn, but there was no going back after having traveled such a long distance. We split into three groups. One at the center was to be the main assault team and the two others on the flanks. The watchtower of the enemy was up above us, men clearly visible looking out the other way. From the bank of a pond, I quickly surveyed the bunkers which were level with us. I ordered to open fire, first on the watchtower. The silence of the morning was shattered with the loud burst of guns. I saw the men from the towers fall like stones. The enemy returned with the intense fire. Our men targeted the opening of the bunker to neutralize the fires. While the engagements continued, it became clear that no further gains can be made. A stalemate had been reached. I took cover on the bank of the pond to reflect the next move. Enemy could call for reinforcement from Navarron, headquarters of 22 FF, few miles away and as well encircle us since we were a detached group without any force to rescue us. I took a long puff of Charminer cigarette and decided to ask for artillery support from the Indian Army on the other side of the border. In no time, artillery started blasting Navarron, which kept the enemy pinned down. As we were organizing the pullback, a young Muktibahini boy who came from the same locality, entreated me to give a grenade for his last bid to take on and occupy a bunker. This was a rash action and there was no need for it. He was confident that the men in the bunker were dead since no fire was coming from it. Reluctantly, I gave the grenade and he dashed through the open space towards the bunker. A burst of fire came from another bunker and mowed him down in seconds. Several attempts were made to recover his body, 
a couple of men taking hits on the way. It was also getting late for us to retreat under cover of Indian artillery fire, putting the entire platoons at risk. We climbed into the boat and headed for the border. Next day, according to the report reaching us, the body of the young boy was cut into pieces and hanged in the village center as punishment to those who dared to fight against them. Our moral went up, seething for another occasion to square it up with the enemy. Another instance of a different kind. A team of three boys was sent to do a reconnaissance for a mission that was being thought of. Before leaving, they were briefed as usual, including the moral and ethical high grounds of our fight, based on a rightful claim which the Park Army had replied with atrocities and genocide. We had to hold our principle against all temptations and short-sightedness. Any deviation would be met with strict punishments. The boys left stayed out in the field for a couple of days and returning to debrief the camp about the findings. In the meantime, reports came to me that these boys had taken a Pakistani sympathizer for questioning, took some money from him and threw him in a bag into the river. I was raving with anger and asked them to confront the news. They maintained silence, which enraged me even further. I asked the Havildar Major to put them under arrest in the quarter guard. This was easier said than done. These were first arrests of our own men. And to set up a quarter guard and sentries for such purpose, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, would not only strain our manpower but put our security at risk had the boys decided to escape. But I held my ground and all arrangements were made. I visited the quarter guard and asked them to tell the true story while they maintained silence. They were courageous boys who took part in Putkali raid and I was up against a challenge of a different kind I was not prepared for. I sent Lieutenant Akhtar, who had just joined my camp, for an inquiry. Akhtar took the risk of going inside only for this mission and came back to report that, in fact, these boys had done so. I reported the matter to Major Monzur at the headquarters, who had asked me to send them to the rear headquarters under arrest. I still don't know the fate of these boys at the end. My two cousins, Nuid from USA and Nakib from Canada, came to see me in the jail. They had arrived only the day before. Also, baby Bhabi, my sister-in-law, a Canadian citizen and working for the government, slipped in hiding her identity. They all came from the other side of the world only to find someone who lived yet farther away. I was moved by their warmth but couldn't find words to comfort them. Their eyes gone blank at this strange family gathering. I had almost redefined my life. My heart floated across the wall at will, the mind free of chains. The cell looked like another station on my journey of life. The intimidation, hardships, and the stress of confinement all melting away. I was getting used to the ordeal, even getting over it. The journey to the court did not move me as much as it did before. The stab in the heart was gone, except for occasional aches. I didn't have any problem with time and managed to run short. Men have unique ways to fill up their time, shipwrecked in an island, lost in the wilderness, or locked in a prison. I had rediscovered life within the limits imposed found my own niches and filled with work that was generated, reading books, cleaning the clothes, or just simply lying on the bed, thinking of bygone days and different scenarios that future may hold. It could be watching nature or one surrounding with intimacy, 
that was never felt before. Recounting the balance sheet of my life, if one was a senior citizen like me, and in the process picking up the bits of memories to go over the details and relieve the feelings of pleasures and pains, or just spiritual journey of life and death, while we all carved our limitless freedom to fly to the moon, the planets and the stars and beyond, we have an innate ability to redefine our existence within the walls of prisons and find life worth living. I was, at the same time, dead, alive and kicking. To the bustling world outside, I have few bridges that I could occasionally come by. The touch of reality, the moist eyes of my daughters, an expectation of my wife reminding me of the world I belong to. But then, I have, like others, made the jail my home. Within its walls, we created a network of love, friendship, and occasional disagreement, all muted by the rules of this place. As for me, my mind was free. A daring defiance has made it even more independent. I traveled in time and space with impunity, my emotion unbounded, and faith in the world unshaken. I went through my life story and even made a sense of this confinement. Though in terms of spirituality, the sun would shine, the moon would appear, the clouds would float, the wind would blow and the birds would sing. I would be back in the embrace of love. I am indomitable. Maktoub. Freedom breeze started blowing in our cell. Half of my fellow inmates had been released on bail. A feeling of joy with a tinge of jealousy. Freedom, the first love of mankind. A big crowd gathered in front of Rupsha, so also of Jomuna Yard, to bid them farewell. Seeing of pilgrims on a journey to deliverance. Emptiness took hold in mind and space. The cell had to be reorganized with a lot more space for each of us. A new rhythm to be found. Court appearance for other case, although Sheikh Hasina's bail petition had been rejected, there appeared to be an undercurrent of thaw. Asma in the court, she was glad beyond measure to learn. I thought she knew that on record, I was on bail in this case. I couldn't describe the depth of sudden happiness that showed up on her lingering smile, as if she was about to receive me in freedom or the flash of that moment. Future, though, had crossed her mind, a moment long cherished but allured her on two sure occasions and she had almost lost faith. As if we two were to meet for the rest of our life in the courtroom, across the aisle or the brief moments that the judge occasionally granted and then to part. Me with a lunchbox swallowed up in the cage of the prison van and Asma would walk to the tree-lined boulevard the bustling cities beyond and disappear in the familiar yet distant environs to her fractured world. The next appearance, as usual. On the way, I watched the beauty of the early monsoon. The generous showers had given vibrant life to all. For the small creepers to the towering rain trees, they all looked so contented like a mother pregnant with the first child of her youth. The wind was light and they swung with measure. The sky was covered with layers of dark, endless cloud. The whole day a lingering morning, expectant but listless, a quiet celebration of life in nature, praying in gratitude. As the cross-examination went on in the packed courtroom, my mind drifted away from the charade and I looked to my left beyond Sheikh Hasina. Next to me in the dock, across the glass panel, the red arches that framed my view of the lake and the parliament building beyond, 
a daring concrete structure rising from the waters, like a debota, in white garb, with occasional stripes recalling the convict's uniform. An array of geometrical shapes, circular, triangular, rectangular, were curved out like openings on her formidable fortress facade, while dim lights vaguely brightened the view of the rooms hidden behind, breathing lingering life in silent prayers to avert its death. What could have been a bustling center of a fledgling democracy? The monsoon rain kept pouring. Its own judgment for the day. Did I hear moaning of hearts, sadness that flowed in tears, washing away the dirt around, along with string-like sound, the music in the background. A surreal drama being played out in a courtroom in the name of justice. The small crowd, most in black gowns, lending an eerie ambience. The sun was long retired behind clouds, in shame. Its power lit only in half brightness. Last week, Asma brought some kathali chapa, flowers to the court. I had put them in two vases made out of plastic water bottles on the all-purpose table that I have beside my bed. The flowers dried up long ago, but the deep fragrance of jasmine drove one to the romantic days of youth. All the intervening years, even the months in jail, melting away. The endearing touch of the smells washed me off my worries and regrets, balming me with eternal care of love. The celebration of life all around lifted my spirits. The jail might have walls, but life was bigger stage, towering over them. Freedom was more a state of mind than physical limitation. The intensity of the travels that our mind made, back and forth in time and space, was as real as any others. We were kept waiting at jail entrance because a big group of prisoners was to be sent in, about 20-30 of them squatting in rows, all handcuffed and a few in prisoner's chain. A couple of guards stood facing them, presumably to keep order. I smelled a certain unfamiliar order and started sniffing rather noisily, which unfortunately happened to be my habit. I noticed a boyish face pop up over the shoulder of the guard. Silently, he drew my attention, surreptitiously waving his hands and winked. A few seconds, and then I understood his message and stopped sniffing. Someone in the crowd was carrying ganja and gave out the smell, and the young boy knew it. Unaware of the smell of the drugs, it was amazing how quickly I decoded the wink. Strangely and instinctively, exposing the peddler to the prison guard was seen as the worst option, Hobson's choice. Back in the cell, I wondered at the bonds, that togetherness in the confinement nurture. Two strangers, far apart in age and social status, yet instantly responding to rescue each other. <laughs>